everybody here. Good deal. I just got to myself, so. I uh, ran over in my last class and they didn't tell me. Uh, I'll pause this for a second. Okay, we are now recording. Again, there was a brief recording earlier. But I wanted to go over a few announcements. Um, the first is pretty minor, because neither one of you have looked for me on Friday, but in case you did, this Friday, I'm not going to be here. I don't know if you remember, last week I told you I had meetings in Opelika, statewide meetings for curriculum review, and I was mandatory. I had to be down there. We left at 6 and got back at 3.30, which was a nine and a half hour day, and I'm supposed to have four-hour Fridays, though most of the time I'm more than four hours. Uh, I don't object to that or anything, but we do need some time to get, take care of some stuff I couldn't take care of, so uh, I asked permission and got this Friday off, too. That'll do me. Eight hours I will be off for the nine and a half hours I worked, so I guess that's a good deal for somebody, but not me. Okay, but anyway, I won't be on Birmingham campus Friday, 8 to 12. But then, next week is the bummer. And I don't know exactly what to tell you in this class, uh, but here's the deal. Uh, you remember probably that I have mild form of leukemia. I have to see my hematologist whenever he schedules the appointments, but he only sees patients on Tuesday mornings. No choice, okay? Tuesday mornings is it. Uh, the only choice is times, and they usually assign those. So my appointment is next Tuesday at 1040. That well, means I have to be there for blood work at 940. That means I have to leave campus by 9 o'clock. Appointment being at 1040. Earliest I'd get out of there would probably be 11 and the earliest I could get back to campus would be probably 11.45. Now, that's rough, but, you know, it may not be that early. It may beat it a little bit, or it may be later. Well, this class is, um, what is it, 11.30 to 12.45. So I'll probably be back for this class, but not necessarily at 11.30. So, if you want to come and work on stuff, and then when I get here, we'll have class, that's what we'll do. Okay, and that's what I would suggest that we try to do. If you're not here, I'll go on and have class anyway, but I'll just be recording it. So, if you see Josh, be sure to tell him. You know. All right, that's Tuesday. Then Thursday. Uh, I'm retiring next January, and we're supposed to go to a retirement seminar to make sure we do to get everything done we're supposed to do, and they, I told them where I wanted to go, Tuscaloosa, because they don't do any in Birmingham or Bessemer, uh, so I chose Tuscaloosa, and then they assigned the day, and that's Thursday. <laughs> so I will be gone all day long, that's all whole day affair. So Thursday we won't meet at all. So that's why I'd really like to get in as much class as I could on Tuesday. And then what I'll do on Tuesday is let you know where to go in YouTube videos and cover for Thursday. Unless you want to meet, I have available times Monday morning, Wednesday morning, Monday afternoon, and Friday morning. So if you want to make up the class one of those times in person, Rather than doing the videos, I can do that. Do you have a preference? I'm to do video. video. Okay, so next Tuesday, try to be here, but if you're not here, go to the next Tuesday's video, and I'll explain then what you want me to watch for Thursday. Okay. But we will meet Thursday, today and Thursday. Tuesday will be as soon as I get back, and then Thursday will be the video. Okay. <clears throat> Then Friday of next week, I should be on the Birmingham campus pretty much 8 to 12. I do have a dermatology appointment that they schedule once a year, 
and I asked him to schedule on Friday afternoon. I don't remember what time she, she said, uh, but I'll find that out. If they did it late enough in the afternoon, then I won't have to leave campus early. But if they did it right at 12 or 12.30, I'll have to leave before 12 o'clock to get there. Okay, but we'll worry about that later. All right. <clears throat> Any questions? Either scheduled questions or uh, linear algebra questions. There is one other thing I want to say. I probably shouldn't be saying it. We're supposed to be working on the fall, on the spring, on the summer schedule, and right now they haven't even told us. They're changing things this summer for another reason, and they've told us about two or three different things, and I don't know which one they've settled on. I asked my boss Monday morning. He said I'll find out. Yesterday morning, he said I'll find out and email you. He didn't. So either he didn't find out or he forgot to email me. I called him this morning, but he wasn't in yet, so I don't know. So summer schedule, don't expect it out when they say it's going to be out. If it is, the math will probably be wrong. Because I haven't had a chance to, what they're trying to do is just, it sounds like it's nuts to me. But anyway, that's a different issue. All right, we're in Chapter 2, Matrices, 2.3, the inverse of a matrix, and 2. Theorem 210 on page 69 states this. If C, let me get my pen set up. Okay. If C is an invertible matrix. Okay. What does that mean? C has to be square. Okay. Uh, then not all square matrices are invertible. Uh, but it means it has an inverse. Okay, C has an inverse. Then the following properties are true. If that's the given, C is invertible, these two things are true. First, if AC is equal to BC, okay, now, um, they don't say anything about A or B. By the way, they don't have to be square. If they're multiplied by C on this side, let's say C has to be square, remember, is an N by N matrix. That means A could be any uh, outside number, M, but it has to be by N because the interior numbers have to be the same. So A could be any M by N matrix. But if AC is equal to BC, then C, B must be also an M by N matrix. And they're saying that those two are the same. And if you remember earlier, we said that in general you can't do a cancellation process, but if it, C is invertible, you can. What this implies then is that a has to be equal to B, okay? That's called the right cancellation property. I meant to go back and check. Um, was it too long ago? previous section I can't find it now I should have One other place. So we first did matrix multiplication. I can't find it. Let's 
so forget it. Okay, but anyway, if C is an invertible matrix, then you can cancel out C, the right cancellation property. And number two, okay, if CA is equal to CB, again, this time A and B must be N by M matrices or M by P matrices or something, but they have to be the same size for the products to be the same. This would imply, again, that A is equal to B, okay? And this is the left cancellation property, okay? Now, most of the time you prove these, and they prove the first one uh, like this. It's usually a pretty simple proof. You're given that AC is equal to BC, so that's accepted as a truth, okay? And if they are, then you, because you know that C is invertible, it has an inverse. So you can multiply both sides by the inverse. And that would also be true. Okay? But C times C inverse is what? Identity. So A times I is equal to B times I, but any matrix multiplied by the appropriately sized identity matrix, that means that A is equal to B. So those kind of proofs are pretty straightforward, fairly simple. Okay. So you can prove these, though we've been skipping proofs, a lot of them are pretty simple like that. All right. All right, they're clear? Okay. Now let's look at systems of equations. That's what we started with. That's what we're going back to. For square systems of equations, which means... Same number of variables as you have number of equations, okay? You can use the theorem below to determine whether the system has a unique solution, okay? If A is an invertible matrix, which means, of course, it has to be square and has an inverse, then the system of linear equations... AX equal B, where X and B are vectors, that they bold them up or arrows over them, usually column vectors, has a unique solution and that unique solution is X is equal to the inverse of A times B. Okay, uh, and again, the proof is pretty straightforward. Uh, you can multiply A inverse by both sides. Let's see. No, I'm sorry. Did it on the wrong side. Okay, multiply to the left. A inverse, this would be A inverse times B, and this is the identity matrix, wait, not a vector, identity matrix of the same size as A uh, times X is that, and that of course goes away, so X is equal to A inverse B. Okay, again, pretty straightforward. So, one use of the theorem 211 is in solving several systems that have the same coefficient matrix. Uh, <clears throat> Certainly, this gives you a way to solve a system of equations. But we already have one, capital one dimension, right? That gives you two. And that's just about the most efficient way to do it. I want to say, I don't want to say the most efficient, different say so, but it's generally very efficient. To find the inverse of A and then multiply it by B, inverse of A usually takes more effort than to do with Gaussian elimination. So why do it? Okay. Well, if you've got multiple same coefficient matrix, but you're looking at different B's, okay? And guess what? 
no matter what your V is, that's going to have a unique solution. That's what the theorem says. So, if you're looking at different Vs, each one is going to be a unique solution. If you did gauss jordan you have to do the whole process over and over again. If you have multiple Vs you're looking at, like your, this is, uh, say, your business. This is going to be something about your inventory control or supply chain management or something like this that you're doing. And you say, well, what if I do this or what if I do this? But on your side, everything's the same. But, you know, depending on what you got coming in, that might be changing. You know, there, that's where your variation is. Well, you set up one, do the inverse one time and then just, that's a really easy calculation to make, multiplying matrix by a vector. And so that's where your, your advantage of doing it. So what we're going to do here is use the inverse matrix to solve each system. So here's your system, the first system, A. 2x plus 3y plus z is equal to negative 1. 3x plus 3y plus z is equal to 1. 2x plus 4y plus z is equal to negative 2. Okay? Now it said use the inverse matrix to solve. So basically first let's write down what your matrix is. What is your A? Two, three, one. Stop there. No, you don't need to do the, the B. Just the coefficient matrix. Okay, next. Three, three, one, two, four, one. All right, that's your A. We need to find the A inverse. So how do we do that? Okay, so we'll join this with 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, and we'll row reduce this. Kind of a big boot hiss. What you want to do first? You're usually pretty good at coming up with a neat way to do it. Okay. So switch on, is that what you said? Yeah, okay. So we'll do that first, exchange row 2 and row 1. Row 1 exchanges with row 2. Okay, so this will be 3, 3, 1, 0, 1, 0, 2, 3, 1, 1, 0, 0, and 2, 4, 1, 0, 0, 1. Next. Yeah, I thought that was what you were going to say. Row 1 minus row 2 is the new row 1. Okay? New row 1 then becomes 1, 0, 0, negative 1. Yep, and 0. Perfect. Leave the next row the same. Two, three, one. You think we should flip row two with row three? Because it would be a, if we subtract this thing, it would be a positive one. Okay. Okay. Here's the problem. I, uh, I see where you're going with it. Flip these two and then subtract this. You get a zero here, a one there, and blah, blah, and get rows of stuff there. But you still got something down here. 
that um, well, that will be okay. That will be okay because when you go to change this, you're not going to change the second row. As long as you didn't have to change the second row, that would be fine. So I uh, like what you're doing. Let's try that. If we run into a problem, we'll say stop. This didn't work too well, did it? Okay. I'm trying to get my pen back, but <laughs> all right, finally. Okay. So what we're doing to do is also row two is going to exchange with row three. Okay. So this will be a two, four, one, zero, zero, one, and two, three, one. One zero zero. Okay. Next, we'll do row two minus row three. All right. Leaving row one alone. One zero zero negative one one zero. And what's your new row two? Zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, one. Okay, and your bottom row. Let's go on and deal with it now. Wait, wait. Yeah. Okay. Negative 2 row 1 plus row 3 is the new row 3. All right, let's do that one. 0, 3, 1, 3, I think. Negative 2 and 0. Okay. Next. It's the new row 3. Okay. And by the way, 1 is just like we want it. We don't want to change the thing in that. So that stays again. 1. Zero, zero, minus one, one, zero. Row two is just like we want it. Zero, one, zero, negative one, zero, one. And then you row three is now zero, zero, one. Six, negative two, negative three. Boy, they all look nice until you got that last one, didn't they? Okay. So this looks like it is going to be your A inverse. Before I go too much further, let me just make sure. Yes, look at that. Exactly the same. Okay. Now, what we do is take your A inverse, which is this, and multiply it. This is a minus 1, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, and 6, negative 2, negative 3, and multiply that by our B which in this case is minus 1, 1, 2. And let's see what we get. This should be our x. Okay? So what do you get? Are the sizes right? 3 by 3 by 3 by 1 is 3 by 1. Okay? So you should have ding, ding, ding. Okay? First entry.
to next century. Three, next century. Say again. No, wait, I messed up. Wait, ooh, my pen didn't erase. Okay, all right. Try that again. I was doing too fast. That's a negative six, and negative two would be negative eight, and another negative six, negative fourteen. Not exactly what I was expecting, but let's see. Uh, so in that case, you get. How did they get that? That's a negative two. I thought something looked strange there. So let me go back that. Yeah. I don't know if I have to erase them all, but I think I will. Okay. Let's try that one more time. It helps to copy the problem right. Yeah, the two was still the same. Okay. The next one's going to be. Um, one, yeah, negative one, and the, yuck, and the last one's going to be, negative two, all right, two, negative one, negative two, all right, now, that would have been easier to do if we'd have done Dow, Dow score them because guess what? All your first steps here would have been the same. You just wouldn't have had to do them but one row here, which would have been your constant row, and then you'd have been at your answer already without even doing that. But since you have gotten the A inverse, and you look at the B one, the B one has the same set of coefficients. It's just that now the new vector here, I'm hoping the coefficients are the same. Yeah, they are is 485. So we do the same thing, use the same A inverse, negative 1, 1, 0, negative 1, 0, 1, 6, negative 2, negative 3, and do that by 485. I hope I got my signs right since there aren't any signs. <laughs> Hopefully those are right. And what do we get here as our answer? What you get on the first one? Four. Next one. Is it one? Okay, and the last one. I did it fast, is that right? And the last one is zero, zero, zero is the input. So you have a negative one, one, zero, negative one, zero, one, six, negative two, negative three. Multiply that by zero, zero, zero. And guess what you get here? Second. Zero matrix again. 
uh, zero vector, which is a matrix too, but yeah, you get the zero. That is a trivial solution. The only way all those could be zeros if all your inputs are zeros, okay? And if you're running a business, that's probably not a good idea. Okay, so. Uh, okay, that finishes 2.3. Homework exercises here would be any of the odds, 1 through 5. They're all at Calc Chat. Any of the odds, 7 through 29 or at least through 25, they're all at Calc Chat. You can attempt 27 or 29 if you would like. That would be a little challenging. Uh, you could do any of the odds 31 to 35. They should all be at Calc Chat. 37 or 39 should be at Calc Chat. Uh, 41 or 43 should be at Calc Chat. 45 or 47 should be at Calc Chat. 49 or 51 should be at Calc Chat. Those are getting fairly long there, aren't they? Um, 53 should be at Calc Chat. 55, 57, and 59 should all be at Calc Chat. 61 should be at Calc Chat. Then you have a few proofs. 63 through 69 should all be at Calc Chat. And those usually aren't too bad. Uh, 71 should be at Calc Chat. It's a true false. Uh, 73 is a writing exercise if you are interested in that. I don't know how much will be at Calc Chat, but they should have something. Uh, 75 should be at Calc Chat. Um, 77 is another proof uh, dealing with a matrix called a householder matrix. Um, and I have no idea why they name it that. I don't think it has anything with owning a house. It may be some weird person's name. I don't know what it is. But if that is something that's of interest to you, you might want to take a look at maybe doing a paper on it. That's up to you. Hint, do the paper. Okay. Now, 79, you could probably do. It should be a count chat. 81 and 83 are both writing exercises. I don't know how much will be a count chat for that. All right. Now we're moving into a new area. And these are elementary matrices, okay? Now, quick review. Way back in 1.2, we introduced the three elementary row operations for matrices. What were they? You can do to any. Uh, we first had them as equations, then we called them elementary row operations. What are three operations you can always do? Swap. 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 Okay. Add a multiple of one to another. Exactly. Those are the three elementary operations. In this section, you'll see how to use matrix multiplication to perform those operations. Sounds Strange, doesn't it? So here's the definition of an elementary matrix, which is what 2.4 is dealing with. First, it has to be square. N by N matrix. Has to be square. Uh, that is an elementary matrix. Okay, I'm going to abbreviate. When it can be obtained... Okay, from the identity matrix, I'm just going to call it I sub N because it's an N by N matrix, by a single elementary operation. Okay, that's it, okay? It's an elementary matrix uh, when it can be obtained from, from the IN, from the identity matrix of the same size, by a single 
elementary operation. Okay. So, what are those elementary operations? First one, exchanging two rows. So if you take I in, I sub n, and exchange any two rows, first and second, second and third, first and third, with it. That's one elementary row operation that would give you one zero, let's see, let's, the one I said first was zero, one zero, one zero zero, zero zero one. That would be an elementary operation. Swap these two, it would be one zero zero, uh, zero zero one, zero one zero. That would be an elementary uh, matrix. Or first and third, that would be zero zero one, zero one zero, one zero zero. Those are the only three elementary matrices you can get from that first operation. That's where the three by three. Now, seven by seven, you should do a lot more, but you know, we won't do this, hopefully. Okay. Now, or take any other elementary operation and do one single thing, okay? And then you have an elementary matrix, okay? Only one. So let's look at example one and see which or if any of these are elementary matrices. I'm going to erase what we got here so I can write more on this one. Is this an elementary matrix? 1, 0, 0, 0, 3, 0, 0, 0, 1. Is that an elementary matrix? Huh? Okay, one more time I couldn't hear. Now, weren't there more parts to that last example that we did? Oh, yeah, yeah, we only did the first elementary row operation. Any of the elementary row operations, you do one of them to any matrix, any identity matrix, that will give you this. I was talking about for the last example that we did in that section. Oh. Maybe skip some. I was the A, B, and C part. Uh, we did A, B, and C. We did. All you had to do was one inverse matrix because they were all the same. Oh, okay. Yeah, and then you just plugged in the three different Bs and you got the solutions. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Okay. So, on to this one. Is that an elementary matrix? Uh, yeah. yeah, because you just did one elementary row operation multiplying the second row by a constant. Non-zero constant, by the way. Okay. B, is this an elementary matrix? 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. Is that an elementary matrix? Absolutely. Great answer. It's not square. It can't be. C, it's yes in Spanish. 1, 0, 0. Zero, one, zero, 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 zero. Is that an elementary matrix? Um, no. Why not? So you yes, and you have to multiply by a non-zero number, okay? <coughs> so that's not. How about this one? D. One, zero, 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 one, zero, one, zero. Is that an elementary matrix? ugly as it is. Yeah. Yes, because you exchange the second and third rows. A single operation. How about E? 1, 0, 2, 1. Is that an elementary matrix? Yeah. Why? Second? It is square, but not all square matrices are elementary. What single row operation did you do? Yeah, that's it. You added the twice the row one to the row two. Single row operation. How about this one? Uh, one, zero, 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 two, zero, and zero, zero, negative one. Is that an elementary matrix? 
not quite. So you get a two elementary output. Multiply the middle row by two, the bottom row by minus one. Two elementary row operations that only allow the nines, only allow the okay? So no, that one is not. Um, okay. Now, they say this is helpful, okay? I don't see it's that helpful, but you can do it. Elementary matrices are useful because they enable you to use matrix multiplication to perform elementary row operations as demonstrated here, okay? All right. First question, is this an elementary matrix? Zero, one, zero, one, zero, 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 one. Is that an elementary matrix? Yes. yes. How did you make it? Okay, now I'm going to take that elementary matrix and I'm going to multiply it by matrix A, which is 0, 2, 1, 1, negative 3, 6, 3, 2, negative 1. Okay, that's just old, some old matrix A, okay? Not elementary, not even pretending to be. But let's do the matrix multiplication. Can you do that multiplication? Sure. What size will it be? Three by three. Okay. Let's do the one one entry. And what do you get? One is the first. Yeah. Okay. You've already done it. Okay. Next. Negative three. And next. Six. Okay. Next. Zero. Next. Two. Next. One. Next. Three. Two. Negative one. Okay. What can you tell me about the new make that you use? exactly what you did to the, get this elementary matrix, wasn't it? So this just replicates, this does the same thing to A that was done to it to make it an elementary matrix, okay? Now, so why do that? Why don't you just walk the two rows? <laughs> I mean, I, well, that's coming up. The reason for this is coming up later, okay? But that is, you're absolutely right. It enabled, that was just another way to swap the first two rows of, of matrix A. Okay? Then this next one. And that, again, an elementary matrix. 1, 0, 0. 0, 1, half, 0. Or a matrix, I'll say that, and 0, 0, 1. Is it an elementary matrix? Okay? And here is your new matrix A, very different matrix A, 1, 0, negative 4, 1, 0, 2, 6, negative 4, 
and 0, 1, 3, 1. Okay, let's multiply those two matrices together and see what you get. Can you multiply them together? Is that a permitted action? Yeah, 3 by 3 by 3 by one, uh, 4 is a 3 by 4. So that'll be... All right, what you get? 1, 0, negative 4, 1. Okay, you're pretty quick there. Next. Zero, one, three, negative two. Next, zero, one, three, one. Okay. Now, how does this compare to your A? Two, exactly what you did to this to make that elementary matrix, you did the same operation there. So, why do it? No, I can't. All right. Let's well, see. Those two worked. Exchanging two rows and multiplying by a non zero constant. Let's see if this one will work. Uh, one, zero, zero. Two, one. Yeah. Two, one, zero. Zero, zero, 001. Is that an element? If I write it correctly, will that be an elementary matrix? Yeah. Okay. And we'll multiply that by 1, 0, minus 1, negative 2, negative 2, 3, and 0, 4, 5. And certainly we can make that multiplication happen. It'll give us a 3 by 3. What are those entries? 1, 0, negative 1. That was quick. 0. Uh, negative 2. One and zero four five. How does that matrix compare to A? Certainly row one and row three didn't change. What happened to row two? Exactly. Exactly the same operation you did to make this an elementary matrix. That's the operation on this one to give you the result. Okay. So, we see that the uh, an elementary matrix will do to any other appropriately sized matrix exactly the operation that was done to make it an elementary matrix. Okay. Um, now, Notice we're multiplying always on the left by your elementary matrix. Uh, we haven't tried doing it on the right. Um, I don't know if we're going to. Goodness, my eyes are watering like crazy. Uh, but you can operate on non-square matrices as long as they are of the appropriate size. Uh, and they go through all that. In each of those products in example two, you are able to perform the element. Oh, yeah, okay, we've already said that. Um, now, this next theorem is stated without proof. All shucks. We don't get to prove it. Um, and how are we doing on time? We're okay on them. Yeah. Okay. Theorem 12. Uh, two, two. <coughs> Can't talk. 212. Let E 
be an elementary matrix. Elementary matrix obtained by performing an elementary row operation that's going to be an ERO, elementary row operation, on I sub M. Why did they change the M now? I'm not sure, but that's okay. That's what your E is. If that same elementary let me call it ERO again. ERO elementary row operation is performed on an M by N And it would have to be an M by N if I is uh, of order M, then your E will be an M by M. So you would need to multiply it from the right to this, so the other on the, I mean, from the left to the matrix or the matrix on the right of the E. And it would need to be an M by N, okay? Matrix A. Then the resulting matrix is the product E times A. Okay, for E is all okay. So this is sort of saying backwards of what we were just saying, doing. We multiplied and then said we got this. This is saying if you perform the same elementary operation on the matrix A, then you get the same result in the A. Oh yeah, M by M matrix A, uh, then that's the same as multiplying E by okay. Basically, saying what we did sort of in reverse. Now, again, you may be wondering, well, why are we doing this? It's longer than, than just doing it. Most applications of elementary row operations require a sequence of operations. For instance, Gaussian elimination usually requires several elementary row operations, one after another after another, to row reduce a matrix. This translates into the multiplication on the left, remember, by several elementary matrices. The order of multiplication is important. The elementary matrix immediately to the left of A corresponds to the row operation performed first. And example three, they say, is going to illustrate that. Okay? So let's clear the board. Okay. It says here, find a sequence of elementary matrices that can be used to write the matrix A in row echelon form. So here's matrix A. 0, 1, 3, 5. 1, negative 3, 0, 2. 2, negative 6, 2, 0. 0. OK. Now. What I'm going to do is write over here the appropriately sized E. What will be the size of that E? Say again. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. Appropriate size I. 
we're going to be doing E's in a minute, but we're going to do I's to begin with. Actually, remember, the E's are always multiplied on the left-hand side. Okay? The A is put on the right-hand side. So that would need to be a 3. I3. Okay. 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1. You didn't have to write that, but I'm just doing it because I got something up there for A, so let's do the other. Now, what would be your first elementary row operation you would do to get this in um, row echelon 4? Row what? 2 and 1? Yeah. Okay, row 1 exchanges with row 2. Okay. So this will be 1, negative 3, 0, 2. This will be... 0, 1, 3, 5, and the last stays the same. 2, negative 6, 2, 0. Now, what elementary row operate, elementary matrix does that same thing? They're calling this E1. What's that? You do what now? Yeah, you use the identity matrix. You do that same operation. 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 1. Perfect. Okay. What would be the next elementary row operation you would do to A? To get it in row echelon form. Um, row one times negative three, row one plus row three. Okay. So row one stays the same. One, negative three, zero, two. Row two stays the same. Zero, one, three, five. What's your new row three? Zero. Zero. Two. Negative four. Okay. What's the second elementary matrix you do? Now, Remember, elementary matrix doesn't do on the last elementary matrix. It always goes back to the identity matrix. So what would that next elementary matrix be? They say, but still, you don't start with E1, you start with the... Yeah, you go back to I, I3. Yeah. One, zero, zero, you didn't change row one. You didn't change row two. Uh, yeah, yeah. I forgot to put my. I just realized. Got to put my one down there. Okay. Negative two zero one. Perfect. Okay. Because you did minus two times row one and add it to row 3. Perfect. All right. Next elementary row operation to get it in row echelon form. Notice I didn't say reduce row echelon form, just row echelon form. Um, so not going to do Josh Jordan, just Gauss. Okay, what would that be? Uh, 
Okay. What would be your third elementary matrix? One, zero, 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 zero one, zero, and what? Zero, one half. Perfect. Okay. <coughs> Just look and see if they got it right. I think they did in every instance. Okay. Now, this now is where it gets a little bizarre. Okay. We're going to name this at the bottom matrix B. Okay, it's the reduced, no, it's the row echelon form of matrix A. Okay, now, without doing it, if we had started with matrix A and then first operated on it with E1, that would have produced this matrix B. Oh, that did the same thing. Then if you operated on that with E2, again from the left, you would have gotten this matrix. And then if you would have operated on that from the left with your E3 down here, you would have wound up with B. Okay, so you're kind of going backwards, okay, uh, as you did that. So... The definition of row equivalent matrices is restated using elementary matrices, not just elementary row operations. So let me clear this. You okay with it? Mm -hmm. Okay. And here's the definition of row equivalents. Let A and B be M by N matrices. Okay. Matrix B is row equivalent R E row equivalent to A when there exist a finite number of elementary matrices okay writing stinks uh, e1 E2, E3, dot, 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 up to E sub K, has nothing to do with the M or the N, K, however many it takes, such that your B is going to be equal to the E sub K, times the e sub k minus 1, times the e sub k minus 2, dot, 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 times e sub uh, 3, times e sub 2, times e sub 1. Goodness, I can't. Okay, it's just, okay. E sub 1 times A. You had to start with A and start operating on them by multiplying by these various elementary matrices as many as it took to get to uh, the B. Uh, and then that's what your B is. Exactly corresponding to the elementary row operations you would have been doing on A 
now you're represented by these elementary matrices. Okay. Now, if you go back to 2.3, which we just left, uh, not all square matrices are invertible. Every elementary matrix, however, is invertible. Moreover, the inverse of an elementary matrix is itself an elementary matrix. Okay? So here's the theorem. Uh, Two point thirteen. That was it. Right. Oh, are we? I was afraid we were getting close. We'll start with two thirteen next time. Let's see if we. I know we got far enough to get some examples done. Let's see. Ooh, this is a long section. Um, I know you can do any of the odds one through seven. That's just identifying if they are elementary matrices. Um, I think you can do either 9 or 11. All these are at Count Chat. And you can do any of the odd 13 to 17. They're at Count Chat. We'll stop there and pick up next time with 19. All right. So I think today we started in 2 3 and ended in 2 4. Is that right? Google this.